All right. Good morning, guys, and welcome to Petra Coach's Thought Leadership Webinar Series. Petra Coach is a mind shift business that empowers leaders and their teams to scale their organizations through the facilitation and implementation of the Rockefeller Habits. With a wide network of thought leaders and industry experts, these webinars serve as an opportunity for you to connect personally with them and ask your most uh, pressing business questions. Today, we have Karen Kopp with us. For the last 25 years, Karen has run a company of senior level business developers known as door openers who land executive level prospect meetings for their clients. Kopp Consulting is a three-time Inc. 5000 winner and has been named Sales Outsourcing Provider of the Year. Karen is also the sales messaging coach for the Scaling Up Coaches Worldwide and a best-selling author of the book Business, or sorry, Biz Dev Done Right. Today, Karen's giving us a power hour of sales B12, where she will uncover the most up-to-date information on what is working to get you in the door with the most important B2B prospects, what you can do if your pipeline's not as robust as you think it should be going into the year, and new sales effectiveness metrics to tell if your sales strategy is working. As a reminder, this is an interactive session and we want to hear from you. So at the bottom of your screen on the toolbar, you will see a Q&A and a chat button. We encourage you to use those throughout anytime you have a question or comment for Karen. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to you. Oh, well, thank you very much. And uh, welcome everybody from uh, not snowy Florida. It's, uh, it's beautiful here and uh, I'm excited to be here with all of you. I'm going to share my screen. Give me one second. Okay, and uh, and please tell me what you're seeing. Are you seeing the right? We see the uh, full PowerPoint with the slides on the side. So if okay. you go to yeah, yeah. I, um, yeah, you're seeing the full screen now. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes uh, Zoom is not your friend, and sometimes it is. So today it's going to, it's going to be my friend. All right, everybody. So we're going to have a power hour of sales. And um, and and as we were told, I am the door, the chief door opener at Cop Consulting. We get our clients in the door with their prospects for the first meeting. We collect all sorts of information about what's working now in business development. So part of what I'm doing uh, today, and especially in January, is just sharing what's working now in business development so that you can accelerate your success too. I always like to start these kinds of presentations with some sales truths. And so here we go. I'm going to put up four sales truths. And what I'd like you to do is to... Uh, put in the chat, not in Q&A, but put in, in the chat, which one speaks to you most and why. And we'll give a couple of people a chance to come off mute and share a little bit about that. Your best clients and referral partners from before may not be your best ones now. Not all closed deals are the right deals. Not all sales activities are effective activities. And not all great sales hunters are great door openers. So which speaks to you most and why? Let's see, number two. Yeah, one number two, not all sales activities are effective. Okay, two and three, three and four. Okay, who would like to come off mute and just share a little bit about why you chose what you chose? Can you pick somebody, please? Absolutely. I'm going to pick our first person who responded, Miranda. I'm going to take you off mute. Do, 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 do. Allow to talk. Hi, Miranda. Are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, no, thank you for this, Karen. Um, that number two hits home, um, or sorry, number, yep, number two hits home for me because being in kind of more of an early stage business, um, where it's getting out, and I have a lot of people contacting me, but I'm still not exactly clear on, you know, what the right target market is, and there's that urge to say yes to everything, I think, and, and because you want to help people, or you don't want to walk, you know, let, let revenue walk out the door, um, but I'm definitely in a situation where I can sort of feel in my gut when something is not right, but I'm still having a really hard time saying no uh, when they're just, you know, ready to sign. Yeah. And that happened specifically to a lot of companies around the pandemic because their definition of a good closed deal changed because they just needed to find who was spending and find money anywhere. 
But now that we are beyond the pandemic, it's time to go back and redefine what the right kind of closed deal is, and then go back and review what do you have in the pipeline? Is it really, does it represent the kinds of deals that will be good deals, the kinds of clients that would be good clients, and to get a little picky? Because if, the more picky you are, the more time you have to focus on the kinds of clients that will be the right ones for you. Who else would like to share? All right, I'm going to go ahead and put Michael on there. He said three and four. Okay, Michael, not all sales us? activities are effective activities and not all great sales centers are great door openers. Go ahead, tell us why that's speaking to you. Oh, number three, not all sales activities are effective activities. Sometimes I think you work so hard to get in the door and when you get an opportunity, you drop the ball. Um, so I think once you get the opportunity, it's just really important to make sure there's just a great interaction with the customer and you over exceed your promises. Yeah. And, then, and, and so yeah. how, oh, go ahead. Finish your thought. Oh, I was jumping in number four. No, we can stick number three right now. Oh, you're going to stick with that one? Okay. Yep. Yeah. And, and not all sales activities are effective activities. And, you know, what that does is if you spend a lot of time uh, researching a prospect, getting a meeting, getting to the next step, and you're not effectively nurturing the prospect through the sales process, you could unnecessarily elongate your, your sales cycle. Uh, something that could close in three months might close in six or 12 or never. Uh, and you may lose an opportunity to the person who is spending the time doing the most effective activities. I mean, if you think about it, as you're going through your day, you probably have 150 different things to do. I know I do. And making sure that you're going slow enough to do something effectively is important. So let's say, for example, instead of sending an email that just says checking in, well, what, what about providing some value? Now, yes, that takes a little longer to think it through and maybe do a little research, look at where you left off last time, but it's going to deepen the relationship and get you further faster. Why don't we take one more? All righty. Um, let's see, who said it? Number one, how about Donald? Are you on there? Hello. Hi. Uh, so, uh, we, we rely a lot on, um, client referrals and repeat business and, um, our, the people doing business with us aren't necessarily in charge of the projects. They have to, uh, work for an end user. And, mm -hmm. um, so that, that business changes, the relationship changes, their situation changes, and we don't always get the, uh, the same projects or referrals to new people just because people change. Right. People change. So how how are you keeping track of that as different people move from from your sphere into a different sphere and new people come in? Um, well, if there's new people coming in, we usually get introduced to them in in some fashion um, or at least we're alerted that somebody's leaving. Mm -hmm. um, but as people's careers change, their um uh, their network changes. So we're not getting the same referrals through them. Mm -hmm. uh, so keeping track of that is uh, impossible, I would think. <laughs> well, a CRM could be your best friend when it comes to that. If, if you're keeping track in a CRM, which I highly recommend, if you don't have a CRM, an Excel spreadsheet will do it for you and a calendar. Because what's really important about that is to keep track of all of the people who are in your life and as they leave your life and they go to another company, you may want to do business with them. And if you're following them to the next place that they go and opening up a conversation with them there, it just widens your sphere. And then as the new people are coming in, you're keeping track of exactly who they are as well. You're adding them to your email marketing. You're linking in with them. You might want to find out when their birthday is and make sure that you're wishing them a happy birthday and, and keep that, that relationship nurturing going. And the best way to do that is to keep track of it. If you are using a CRM, 
I highly recommend the set task feature. Uh, for us here at, at COP Consulting with our door opener service, it is our best friend because there's no way that you could keep track of all of the people in your life, your current clients, your the prospects who are already in rotation, and then the prospects who you want in your rotation. How are you going to keep track of all those people along with the centers of influence as well? And the best way to do that is by using the CRM and setting a task to make sure that you're keeping in touch with them. And, and I don't mean a drip campaign that goes out from your marketing department. This is human contact and human relationships. So these, this is some good discussion. <clears throat> so because you're in the beginning of the year, uh, I, I get several comments from people about how their year is starting out. And this visually depicts what people are telling me is uh, their their top challenge or challenges. Usually they're on one side of this. They're either on the guy on the left who is standing there in front of this big chasm and he needs to get in the door with more prospects. And a lot of times our phone rings at the end of the year because people have that oh, oh yeah, yeah, moment at the end of the year. And they're they're saying, I don't have enough coming into the first quarter to make my first quarter numbers. I just put an article about that out this week, uh, or maybe it was last week, about uh-oh, that oh, oh poop moment uh, that they're coming into the year. The other complaint I'm hearing from people is the guy sitting on top of that maze, because as difficult as it is to get the door open to the exact right new prospects, especially when they're at the executive level, it's no picnic once you're in the door to figure out how you get to that bag of cash, which is why that's a maze and he's sitting on the top of it with his head in his hands. And so we're gonna focus on the first part and here's why, because the guy who's sitting on the top of the maze, he is likely sitting there because he didn't focus enough last quarter and the quarter before, putting enough new prospects in the top of his funnel. Because if he did, then the fact that some of them aren't closing or moving through the, the uh, sales cycle as quickly as he hopes, not going to really bother him if he has enough of the right opportunities in, in the top of the funnel. Now, there's efficiencies, of course, as you're going after you get in the door, through to the, the bag of cash, and that can be the subject for a different day. But if you had enough of the right opportunities in the front top of your funnel, it wouldn't matter. If something's taking a little longer to close, it wouldn't matter. If something doesn't close or if they choose your competitors instead, because you have so much coming through that's exactly right, that you're not going to miss your quarter. You're, you're not going to miss your half. So the very first part of this, and, and as we're focused on, from the guy standing on, on the side over to getting in the prospect's door, there's five planks of door opening success. And, and if anybody's listened to me before, you've probably heard about this, but let's review them. And then we're going to talk also about how you can pick these planks for yourself and, and fix them and make sure that they're right. And the first one has to do with right target. What I've noticed is that when people have a lot of pro proposals stuck in the bl big black hole, they're not moving, prospects go silent, a big offender is it never was the right prospect to begin with. So what I am suggesting is instead of a ready fire aim, which a lot of people do, I'm recommending start out this year with ready aim fire. And that means going back to the drawing board and deciding who are your peeps? Who are the prospects who are going to become your very best clients? People say to me often, oh, it's all about who you know. Well, it's not only about who you know, that helps too, but it's about who needs to know you and do enough of the people who need to know you, are they part of the prospects that you're pursuing right now? And if not, why not? Let's put them on, on the list. If you know someone who knows them, great. If they're part of a group, great. If they go to the con co the conferences that you go to, great. But if they don't, it's okay because you can reach out to somebody directly, say something meaningful and get a meeting with somebody you don't know. And the reason why I am confident that this can happen is because I run a company that does this every day for our prospects and we are getting our prospects these meetings. People said to me when the pandemic hit, it's harder than ever to get in the door and get a meeting. That is not what we found. We found it was easier 
because the the uh, the decision makers were accessible via their cell phones and without the um, the assistance blocking the calls because they were working remotely, they were working a hybrid schedule. Now they've become used to getting calls from people they don't know on their cell phones. So not that I recommend that as the first outreach, but definitely after you've sent a, a well-written email and, and given them a, a voicemail on their um, work phones, there's no reason why you can't reach out to them on their cell phones. We are doing it and, and it is working. So let's dive a little deeper when it comes to how do we get really picky with the kinds of prospects that we pursue. So most people, when they think about choosing prospects or an ICP, they'll think about size of company, level of decision maker, industry niche, even geography. But we take it further than that and, and make this wide world of prospects. And once you choose industry niche geography and all the things I just said, you might have a smaller world of prospects. We want to get really narrow when it comes to business development and only spend our time pursuing prospects who really deserve your time and attention. In fact, one of the sales effectiveness metrics, and I'm gonna go through a list of these later, but one of the sales effectiveness metrics that we monitor and we recommend you do too, is the percent of prospects in rotation on your list who are the exact right prospects. And you can imagine that that metric needs to be pretty close to 100%. Because if it's not, then you're spending time on prospects who are not going to become good clients for you in the end. Why do that? Focus only on those prospects who could be the best clients. Well, how do you do that? All right, there, there are three additional filters that we recommend to implement so that you're taking this wide world of prospects and getting it to be a little bit more narrow. And here they are. Obvious solution, willingly pay, and urgency. What group or groups of prospects out there once they know you exist, will say, I can't meet, I can't believe I didn't meet you six months ago. Where do I sign? What, what groups of prospects are those? So it could be, let's say there's a, a group of prospects out there that utilizes a certain technology. And if they do, they are more likely to need you, more likely to find you an obvious solution than the other prospects that are out there. That's just one example of a filter that you can use to make the world a smaller place. Like for example, for us, when we're getting our clients in the door at the executive level, if a company is investing heavily in Zoom info information, for example, it's likely that they're, they're spending money and they're investing on getting new doors open. If they're doing that, they're likely having trouble getting new doors open because if they're successful, their salespeople are going to be busy nurturing the relationships and closing the sales. If they're not successful, they need us to. So obvious solution is one of them. And I'm going to put up a little QR code, uh, probably a couple slides later, that will walk you through this thinking in a 10 minute video. So as I'm talking about this, you're going to have a tutorial and I'll give you a lot of different examples too on that video. And then you can do this for yourself. And if you want, you can send it to me and I'll, I'll check your thinking and giving, give you some feedback. Willingly pay is another one. Which groups of prospects are going to willingly pay what you want to charge for your services? When people hit my doorstep, they usually don't want to sell on price. They usually want to sell on value, but not every prospect out there is going to pay for value, no matter what you say. You can present the most logical reason why they should pay for value, but they may not. The other thing that's part of willingly pay is just because somebody has a problem to solve does not mean they're going to spend time and money to solve it, even though they know they should. How early in the conversation can you figure that out so that you're providing them resources and help but yet you're not spending all of your time trying to convince them of something that they never might be convinced about. Rather, let's focus on the prospects that are more likely to say yes from the get-go and put on the B list or C list or don't call list, the people who are not going to meet these circles. So obvious solution, willingly pay. And the last one is urgency. Not all prospects will feel the same amount of urgency around having a meeting with you and moving forward with you than others. 
which kinds of prospects are more likely to feel urgency? And I'm going to give you one very simple example so we can move on to the next thing. But let's say there's legislation affecting your prospects and they have to make a decision. Well, if that situation exists and you can take the people who are not facing that legislation and remove them from the list and focus on this group, this group will more likely feel urgency. And then, of course, you need to say something that's meaningful to those people. And we'll get into that in just a second. So when you identify all the different filters for the prospects where you are going to focus your time, then it's time to take a look at who's on your list and do they still deserve to be there? Now, of course, this isn't in a CRM, but visually I'm just sharing with you. If you have, let's say, Sandy Cole up at the top and Evan Hill, these are two different prospects that are in your rotation, and one of them has a check mark in every single one of the criteria, and the other one doesn't, like Evan, willing to pay, not, not really there. Well, why would we spend time on Evan if we can find more Sandys? This is what I'm saying is to be very choosy. Go through your prospect list that you have now and decide, do all of them still deserve your time and attention? And if not, let's let's move them to a B list, get those folks on a drip campaign and focus the human contact with the ones who deserve to be there. So once you identify the exact right target group or groups, now it's time to figure out what am I going to say to these people that really will make a difference? Now, people will have their marketing department spend time on a, a value proposition or some marketing language, but that's not sales language. Marketing language and sales language is not the same thing, and that is a blind spot for people out there. What are the words you would say to somebody to help one individual understand why he or she needs to move from one place in, in their thinking to the next? And that is all about sales messaging. If you haven't looked at your sales messaging recently, it's time to take another look at it and decide, is this working as hard for you as it could? And I'm going to share with you in a couple of minutes what we call the cop gap method of sales messaging. We have two trademarks in sales messaging. And this, if you do it right within three sentences, you can basically render your competition irrelevant. And I'm going to share that with you in just a second. And what I wanted to tell you about language, and you probably have experienced this for yourself, is that the person in the sales process who has the best words wins. And that's not always the person who deserves the, the contract. It's not always the person who deserves the contract. It's the person who wins, but that person may have had better words. It's very important to slow down and think about exactly what you're saying to someone. When you write, I would love to meet with you, well, I know exactly why you would love to meet with the prospect, but that's irrelevant. The only thing that matters is why the prospect would love to meet with you. And if that's not in your voicemail and it's not in your live dialogue and it's not in your email, guess what? You will, you will miss out to the person who is spending time to think about what would really matter to that person. Sales, sales language is situational. Where are you in, in the conversation with the prospect? Have you had the meeting? Is it after the first meeting and before the second? Is it the second? Is it the third? Is it the proposal? Because you will need different language for different parts of the sales process. And a lot of people don't spend a lot of time thinking about the words they're using. So we're going to do that in the next couple of minutes. Okay, here I'm going to show you, if you change the language, you can change the outcome. And I became fascinated with sales language a long, long time ago. Uh, when I was 11, I had my first cold calling job. The family I babysat for had a lawn doctor franchise. I don't know if you guys remember that. And uh, the mother said to me, you have a good phone voice. Why don't you go to one of our cubicles in the basement and take out the phone book? Does anybody remember a phone book? And start calling people and see if you can get some appointments for free lawn evaluations. So this whole thing about appointments started a really long time ago. And what I found after she gave me this booklet of what I'm supposed to say, and of course, life doesn't happen according to a script springboard yes script no and uh, so she gave me a couple of scripts and she gave me this really big book of objections and she said here's what you do when somebody says no or they give you an objection you 
flip to the tab of the objection you're facing, and then you put your finger at the top and you scroll down to the part in the page where that's what the answer for the objection. Well, it took me about three calls to realize that that was never going to work. You have to know this stuff cold and you have to be in the moment with that prospect. That means you can't have your cell phone over here. It means you can't uh, have other emails that are open or multitask in any way. You have to have 100% focus on the person with whom you're speaking so that as that person is shifting to the right, you're shifting there too. Shifting to the left, you're shifting there too. And you know what this language is just off the top of your head. So if I found in that in that time period when I was 11, that if I changed what I said, it would change the outcome. If I changed the cadence of my voice, it would change the outcome. When they, are, they speak really fast and I can't talk to you right now, I speak very slowly and it brings them down in energy to where I am. And so then we can continue the conversation. If I speak quickly, the conversation ends sooner. These are just some of the observations that I made at that early age. So let's talk, look at some phrase pairs. So change the language, change the outcome. I'll call you next week. Well, what's going to be different next week? So let's think about what else we could say. Instead of I'll call you next week, how's Thursday at 10? Now you've nailed the date and time. You send them a calendar invite, make sure they accept it. And something that's on the calendar is more likely to happen. When somebody's on the phone with you, what you're talking about is, is the most important thing to them at that moment, even though they have a lot of other things going on too, they might be in that conversation. So instead of trying to reach them and find them next week, just house Thursday at 10 and see how that works for you. Instead of saying, I'll follow up with you in three months, you can say, what will be different in three months? But when you deliver that question, you have to wait a minute and then let them answer. Because if you talk, talk over somebody's uh, thought process, you may never know what the real answer is to, their, to the question. So give them a chance to think about it and respond. Let's work, <clears throat> look at word, word pairs. We, our clients are satisfied with our service versus our clients are grateful for our service. Show and prove. We, I could show you how this works, or I can prove to you how this works. Now let's go into the, the gap method of sales messaging. There's three sentences, and if you fill these out properly, I promise you it will. Oh, thanks, Megan. <laughs> Megan's writing to me in the chat. And it will separate you from your competition in a way that's meaningful. Now, most people will say, here's why we're different, but here's what I have to say to you about that. Nobody cares why you're different. In marketing, maybe. Sales, no. Nobody cares why you're different. They only care why you are of more value to them. And if you can articulate that in language that's relevant and compelling to them, you will be able to move forward. If your language is confusing or if it causes a disconnect, you're going nowhere with that conversation. So the reason why I call this gap is that here's all your, your competitors right here. And by the way, one of your competitors could be doing nothing, right? And then here's you. And the difference between you and everybody else that's out there, including doing nothing, is value. And that's what needs to be articulated. And the words you choose are critical. So here are your three sentences. Anyone can and you fill in the blank, but not everyone can, and you fill in the blank. And then the last one is, for example, I have a, a couple of examples to share with you. And if you guys are ever interested in doing a separate session where we're just diving deep into the gap messaging and you wanna try it yourself and get some real-time coaching, let Petra know and we'll get that on the calendar because those are a lot of fun. All right, here's the, the first example. Okay, this comes from the promotional products industry, by the way. Anyone can say they provide great customer service because in that industry, most of them say that. Anyone can say they provide great customer service, but not everyone can deliver on the promise. For example, we once chartered a plane at our expense to transport supplies on time. 
So when it comes to putting this together for yourself, there's a couple of things to remember. First of all, it's plain English. Don't put any jargon in there. People can't process jargon very quickly. <clears throat> and different jargon means different things to different people. I got to tell you the story. It's so funny. So at one point I was doing uh, some messaging work with a wealth management company and the CEO said to me, it's part of the intake and I was going to develop the messaging for him. He says, oh, we are, uh, we're the quarterbacks for, for this. And he's using it as if I follow football, which I don't. So I have no idea when he says we're the quarterbacks, what does that mean in the world of wealth management and how many people don't follow football that he's used that analogy on and it, it doesn't land. So make sure that when you're writing the sales messaging for you or non-Americans, thanks Miranda, when you're writing the messaging for you, you put on your hat, but then before you use the messaging, you're gonna transfer your seat and you're gonna put on your prospect's hat or it could be your client, anybody you're talking to, you put on their hat and you feel how this lands. Every word, does every work, word work hard for you? Do you understand every word? Are there any words or phrases that could cause a disconnect where that's not, not only not gonna work hard for you, but you're not getting anywhere with that either. Let me give you another example. This one's for us. Anyone can say they can get prospect meetings, but not everyone gets the right meetings. For example, one client hired us after his sales team told them landing certain meetings were impossible. Those were the first meetings we booked. So the other thing that's very important, aside from choosing all the right words and making sure they work hard for you, is the second sentence when the person you're talking to hears that second sentence, they need to nod along in agreement. If they nod along in agreement, you're close to getting that right and being ready to take that out for a spin. And so here, let me give you this. I have a, um, let's see if the QR code is there. There it is. Okay, so I have a 10 minute video on this also where I dive a little deeper. I give you more examples. And, um, and then you can try it for yourself. And if you want to send it to me and uh, get some feedback, I'm happy to do that for you also. Okay, so then remember, when it comes to sales messaging, it's language plus delivery equals outcome. What you say and how you say it will determine the result. If you need to talk to somebody, sending them an email that's 15 paragraphs long is not going to do it. You can text them and say, can I have 10 minutes at the end of today? If that's somebody that you've all already met, uh, you can um, leave a voicemail, but it has to be succinct. Think, think six sentences max for a voicemail, and it has to be very succinct and powerful. Once you have the right target and the right message, then you need to think about what the objections might be. Think about that ahead of time, not when you're in the moment and write down the answers for those objections. If you have a playbook, you're going to put right target, right message, right answers for objections right in the playbook. There are three Ps when it comes to being prepared for objections, pre-think, prepare, and practice. Pre-think, prepare, and practice. If you can answer 90% of the objections that you're going to face before you get on the phone with a prospect, you will be able to dance on the 10% that you didn't think about versus dancing on all of them. The next plank is the right person doing the work. Not all great sales hunters are great door openers. This is a certain kind of person. And I can tell you that because I've run this company for 25 years now. And a door opener, the person who can initiate a conversation with somebody they don't know and enjoys doing that part of the job, wants to spend their time that way is usually a little different than the person who likes to go on the meetings and close the sales. So in our world, the person who goes on the meeting, closes the sales, those are closers. About 96% of all the great sales hunters out there are, are great closers. They're really great, but only 4% in my experience are great openers. This is a DNA thing. I can train a sales team to be better than they are at getting in the door. I Definitely, we can do that. But we can't train them to have the DNA to really love this part of sales. 
You're, so if, if you're out there and you need to add more people to get the door open on your team, you're looking for the DNA. So just to give you a little uh, break in, in the heaviness of this topic, I have an example from the animal kingdom about door opening. And here we go. It's, this video is about five seconds long, so you have to pay attention. Here we go. These are my friend's dogs. Uh, <laughs> the big one is Charlie and the little one is Leo. Uh, when I first met her, she had Charlie and I saw him open the door for himself and go outside to go to the bathroom. I thought that was really cool, but it was even uh, more special for me as the door opener. When Charlie, uh, when they got Leo, uh, Charlie opened the door and let Leo out. That was amazing. Now, why do you think Leo couldn't open the door for himself, but it put it in the chat. Your door can do that too. That's awesome. Why do you think Leo couldn't open the door for himself? What do you think? Put it in the chat. Anybody? He was too short, right? He could practice and practice and practice and practice, and it wouldn't matter. He could never reach that handle. And by the way, that handle needed to be a lever. It couldn't be a knob. If it was a knob, he wouldn't have been able to handle it. So if you change a variable, it changes the outcome. And one of the variables is having the right person doing the work. Yeah, the, the handle was the obstacle, but he couldn't reach it. Uh, for him, that was the biggest part of his problem. So the last plank is the right execution. Is it a phone call? Is it an email? Is it a text? Is it a LinkedIn connect? What, what is it that's going to help the prospect on the first try, third try, 20th try. Because of course, we're not going to ignore these prospects because they're all the, the exact right prospects or they wouldn't be on the list, right? So we're definitely going to keep them in rotation, but we can't say the same thing more than once. We have to deepen the story, deepen the relationship over time. They are not going to answer you on the first try, likely. It's going to take a little bit of time. Our data shows between eight and 12 touch points of value. If they're eight and 12 touch points of crap, then all bets are off. But if it's a value between eight and 12 touch points before you get a disposition, and that disposition can be a meeting, that disposition can be, I'm right in the middle of three uh, massive initiatives, and I need you to call me back in three months. But uh, that disposition takes can take that long on average. But most salespeople don't hang in there that long because they're busy doing other things. So this requires focus. So part of right execution has to do with how much time weekly is being spent talking to the right group of prospects. And when I ask people to keep track of time over let's say a, a four week time period in quarter hour increments and then put down, was that spent on revenue generating activities or was that quarter hour spent on non-revenue generating activities? What, How much was spent on pursuing new prospects. And when people put this down, it's frightening to see how little time is actually spent trying to get in the door. And that explains why there's not as much as there needs to be at the top of the funnel. So who will do this work? Think about it in terms of time, talent, and desire. Who has the time to do this work? You may have somebody who's great at opening doors. Now they have a full middle to bottom of funnel and they need to spend their time there. Maybe it's just not their talent. They're really great at, at middle managers, but when you redefine your target, you really need to get in at the executive level. And while they may be great in sales, they just can't do this part of it for you or not as successfully as you want them to. Um, and desire. You can have somebody who has the time, has the talent, and they would rather put a stick in their eye than do this job. If you don't love the job of door opening, I can tell you it is torture, torture to do it. You might as well find somebody else to do it, either inside your funnel, your, your uh, company or outside. So how will you keep at the top of the funnel full? Uh, here, let's put these in there. So this is not new to anybody. You've all seen the funnel. Uh, top is the new prospects, middle are relationship building and proposals and the bottom is, is closing and approvals. But if let's say you're coming into the first quarter and you don't have as many new opportunities in the funnel as you think you should, that problem is not gonna fix itself. 
You may focus on short-term closes just so you can meet your first quarter numbers, but then in second quarter, you're going to have the same problem. So you need to break the cycle somehow. So this is typically the right under that arrow, what, what people are able to do. They've got the inbound uh, you know, prospects coming in through their email marketing or other marketing initiatives. They may have some referrals from centers of influence. They may be doing some door opening or going to conferences, but that's all they're able to do. Is that enough for you to meet your sales goals? And if it's not, what are you going to do to be able to expand that? So some of the efficiencies that I talked about today may help you get a little further uh, but it's not going to get those outer corners. How are you going to get the outer corners in there too and, uh, and have the new prospect expansion? So sometimes if you don't have either the people internally because they're busy closing sales, you can think about outsourcing door opening. Um, let's, I'm gonna give you a couple of reasons why people will uh, would outsource door opening. And then I'll give you some uh, different ways that you could outsource. What are the options that are out there? If you can close sales when you meet the right prospects, but you just need to meet more of them, outsourcing may be right for you. Your team's time and talent is better spent closing deals than prospecting. You want to meet certain prospects and your team can't access them fast enough. You don't have the time or the desire to build or maybe even rebuild an internal appointment setting capability. You just need one that works. You need meetings while you hire new salespeople so that you can generate sales until the new sellers are on board and contributing. Or in some cases for the leaders, you may just wanna stop wasting money on sellers who can say they can get the doors open, but then they can, or maybe they don't want to. So if you choose to look into the idea of outsourcing, there's a lot of different options that are out there and sometimes they all uh, look the same. So here are four different uh, outsourcing options. The first one up on the left, top left, is a lead generation company with low level SDRs. These are people who are like two years out of college. Uh, they do appointment setting, usually along with an email campaign, but it's not highly personalized um, to, to the prospects. And, um, and if you're looking to get in at the executive level, it may not be, uh, or it could be a mismatch between the tenure of the person who's doing the outreach versus the person who they're calling, in which case they may not be able to hold their own in a conversation. Top right is lead generation company that does email or LinkedIn campaign with no calling. What we have found at the executive level, especially now, is voice is really important. They're getting bombarded 250 emails a day, but their cell phone is sitting right next to them and it is silent. Nobody's calling them especially the less tenured folks are uncomfortable with phone, but usually the decision makers are, are looking for that kind of human interaction. Bottom left, uh, outsource senior level business developers who work at the outsourced companies uh, to get the meetings at the executive level. So this is a one-to-one -one white glove relationship building approach. This is what we do. Uh, we don't hire anybody low level or an offshore call center. So all of these may look the same because they all may say they get appointments, but not necessarily can get the right appointments. So you need to, uh, if you're going to look at outsourcing, think about who your prospects are and will the approach that you decide on, if you decide on one of these four different uh, kinds of companies, which one has the best likelihood of success given your prospects. If they're C-level then you're, or executive level, you're going to need somebody who's got a little bit more seniority in order to be able to hold their own in that conversation. So what can you do to be sure your sales is working? I, this is basically going to summarize, and then we're going to go into some new metrics for sales, these sales effectiveness metrics that I'm talking about. So you have a little bit of a different way to measure your sales. That's coming up in a second. Focus only on the important win prospects. You wanna make sure that the contact information is verified because if you have a lot of crap on your prospect list in terms of contact information, you're going to have your best sellers spending time looking up an email address. We separate those functions. We have a research team that is in charge of making sure that's 100% of the right prospects on the list 
and that the information phone, email, cell phone is already there. Proficiency in using the best sales messaging, including slam dunk, slam dunk objection responses. Those doing the door opening can and will do this job. They like this job and they're going to make sure that they're going to do a great job with this. And the managers of the people who are doing the door opening know how to set it up properly, ready, aim, fire. They also know how to diagnose and resolve issues associated with door opening so that they fix the right problem. Minimize non-revenue generating activities so that you're spending more time generating revenue. Consider dividing aspects of sales. Can you divide the door opening from the people who are going on the meetings and closing the sales? Get the right outside help when needed. Hire the right people for the role. Don't assume that managers and sellers know how to make things better and are in alignment with strategy. At the top, the very top the leader really needs to check on that. Otherwise, six months down the road, you may have some surprises. And finally, incorporate some of these new metrics I'm going to share with you in a second for sales. It's not just about evaluating the people. You need to evaluate the process too, because your, your issue may not be your sales people. Your issue may be that it was never set up properly in the first place, and that manage, need, management needs to provide some, some support and guidance so that the people can, can do their best work. I'm gonna go over a couple of the sales metrics and then I, I think we're going to stop and see if we have some questions. And um, any questions that are in there? Well, let me just stop right now. Any questions that are in there that I didn't see? Uh, we do have one that goes back to when you said that it takes, eight to, that, it takes eight to 12 touch points of value. Um, someone asked, uh, what are uh, some additional uh, information on the types of touch points? Oh, okay. So there's an article that I've written called Lead Nurturing Strategies that actually nurture leads. Um, so I'll I'll make sure that that gets over to you um, for the follow-up email that goes out. But I mean, you can you can do a Google alert on the company, the industry, the individual, and get information that's affecting that person, and then write a well-crafted email. I saw this article come out. I thought it was really important for you. And here's how it applies to our last discussion. Let's have a conversation about this. How's Thursday at 10? Just as an example. But um, the this article will give you, I, I can't remember how many, but there's a big long list of that because we can introduce our, our clients to prospects and some prospects are going to be ready to go right away and go right to proposal. Others need nurturing. And so what do you do to nurture with value to deepen the relationship and keep yourself relevant instead of just calling them and saying, I'm checking in, which means nothing. It doesn't mean any, it might mean something to you, <laughs> but it doesn't need to mean anything to them. So you want to be uh, with them with more value. Standard sales metrics. This we is had what most question people- just pop in. Oh, go ahead. Um, Miranda says, I'd like to measure my closing percentage, but curious the best way to do that when some leads can take one to three months or longer to close. Yeah, so I would define it as first conversation to close sale. However, I, and it doesn't matter whether it takes three months or three years, because some people you talk to now, they're not going to be ready to go until three years from now. But it doesn't mean they're not a good prospect. That's all part of pipeline building. A lot of times people come to me, they're like, oh, I want all these meetings and I want them right away. And of course, you know, we're going to give them meetings right away. But there are some people they're going to meet who are going to be great clients for you, for them in year two or year three. And they are just as important, even though many people don't place importance there because they're so busy closing what's in front of them. But if you nurture the long-term prospects in addition to the short-term prospects, then next year getting more new meetings is just going to be easier because you already have a foundation of people who are interested. It's just a matter of time. Miranda, when it comes to this metric, here's something that I don't see anybody doing. And in fact, I'm going to probably add it <laughs> to the list I'm going to show you in a second uh, because it's not there. But I believe that there are two different metrics for, for measuring closed sales. One is the regular metric that most use, which is you know from any first meeting to close sale. But I would also like to see the metric of the meeting with the exact right prospect to close sale 
Because although I'd like to assume that everybody that you're meeting with is the exact right prospect, uh, sometimes that's not true. And other times you may need to have a conversation with somebody to know if they're the exact right prospect. So I'd really like to see two different measurements on that because your close ratio may look lower than it really is because you're not always talking to the exact right prospects. If Hopefully that will, that will make sense. Okay, so standard sales metrics. This is what most people watch. Number of calls and emails, text connects. Our, our clients love to get that. The number of meetings and conversations. We separate conversations between conversations with decision makers and conversations with assistants because those will lead you in different directions. Um, the number of proposals, number of closed uh, deals and new clients, TAM, which is, in my opinion, more of a marketing term than an actionable sales term, uh, AP, ARR, average recurring revenue. So that's what a lot of people watch. Here's now what I recommend you watch. These are sales effectiveness metrics that most people don't watch. But if you watch them, then you're going to have greater efficiencies with the work that you're doing. And here they are. You know, my animation is, is playing tricks on me today. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. The percent of closed deals, which are the right deals, we talked about that right at the top of the, the hour. The percent of prospects, which are the right prospects, we talked about that one too. Managers and leaders, please check this periodically, once a quarter, if not uh, more, with your salespeople to make sure that every prospect that they're working on really deserves to be on the list. The percent of times you're facing each objection, we we are um, creating our Salesforce instance to be able to track this. Uh, we already track the, the top three objections, but we're going to um, be able to track the percentage of time our clients are facing each objection. Because if you're facing the same objection 75% of the time, guess what? You need to change something about the filters in your prospect list. You may need to change something about your messaging so you preempt that objection, or you may need a stronger answer, but you don't know what you need if you can't, if you're not measuring that. So really important. Uh, the number of open tasks. If you use the set task feature in your CRM, put on the dashboard, the number of open tasks. If you have lots of open overdue tasks, you probably are targeting too wide or not spending enough time on business development. Time to activity. How much, how much time does each activity take you? Uh, and that's pure. So that means for that hour, you're doing pure outreach, phone, email, not looking up email addresses, because then, then your time to activity is not going to be pure. And C, is it taking you too long to research a prospect? Do you have maybe some call reluctance? And that's why your time to activity is so low. A uh, percent of time spent on non-revenue generating activities. We talked a little bit about that. Uh, percent of time, the first meetings go to second meetings. We track this too. 100% of your first meetings should go to second meetings if you're talking to the exact right prospect, you set up enough value during the meeting so that the prospect wants a second meeting, and the percent of sellers who are the right sellers are in the right roles, and the percent of managers who are the right managers who are in the right role. Those things are, are all important. So in our last couple of, of minutes, tell me, uh, you can put it in the chat, what do you think the number one reason is why sales which should close don't close? What do you think? Anybody? Time, yep, what else? Anybody else? Most people willingly pay. Most people tell me that um, the reason why sales which should close don't close is the lack of timely and effective follow through. But actually what I'm seeing is that the reason why they don't close is because people aren't getting in enough doors in the first place. They don't have enough opportunities in the top of their funnel. So this is what we're looking for. We're looking for uh, getting in the door and getting over to the payments. And look, there's a lot of payments behind that too. The carpet in there, uh, once you get in that maze, is gold because there's gold in there. Here's my contact information. I'm going to put it in the chat too. And, um, and those QR codes on the right, 
the QR code is our website on the left. It's the link to those videos uh, that you can have. And um, there's there's a how do you get more first meetings to second meetings is also in that set of videos as well. And um, yes, is it, now we have time for maybe one one more question. I'm yes, gonna absolutely. If anyone has a last question here to close us out. Anybody have any questions? Books to, Books to read. Oh, thank you for asking. Well, this one uh, is called Biz Dev Done Right. It's an Amazon bestseller, and it's all about the blind spots in the sales process that keep you from the success you should have. And uh, this is my book. I wrote this with a, a co-author as well. And so a lot of times people are like, oh, I wish I knew that. Well, we're telling you what you need to know so that you don't get it wrong. And then six months later say, oh, I wish I was doing that. Uh, so I, I would recommend Biz Dev Done Right. And of course, Scaling Up and all the books that Petra recommends as well. <laughs> Karen, thank you Karen, so much for joining us today. Uh, everyone be on the lookout for a recap in your inbox. That'll be there in the next 24 hours. It'll have the notes and a recording to share with your team from today. If you enjoyed this thought leadership webinar, you can find more information on our next one, preparing for an extraordinary exit with STS Capital Partners on January 25th at petracoach.com slash Petra events. Also stay tuned for our next 60 minute habits workshop on improving your priority writing coming up on February 8th. As part of Petra Coach's mission to positively impact 10 million human beings, we thank you for being here today. Karen, thank you so much for your insight and everyone have a great Thursday. Thank you too.